My name is Ronit, and with my podcast partner in crime, Gaurav, we are delighted to have our special guest for this edition, Ashish from Kareem. Ashish, welcome. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having me. Um, Ashish, a lot of the audience of this podcast are based outside the Middle East and Pakistan, outside your footprint at Kareem. For the benefit of the folks who don't live in Dubai or visit the Middle East and are familiar like I am with Kareem, tell the audience a little bit about Kareem. Who is Kareem? And also the latest, most exciting news you've had on Kareem. Yeah, sure. Uh, again, thank you for having me. Uh, Kareem is a super app. Uh, we've started in Dubai about a decade ago. Uh, we started off as a ride-hailing business. And over the last three to four years, we started uh, kind of evolving from a single use vertical into a super app. Mm -hmm. uh, today in Dubai, we have over 10 plus services on the app. Uh, we have ride hailing, food delivery, grocery delivery. Uh, you know, uh, we have payments uh, of different types. Uh, and plus we have some third party services like cleaning, uh, you know, when COVID was going on, we had PCR. Uh, and we have, uh, you know, you can book a car, like you can rent a car long term, you can, uh, uh, you know, you can also buy tickets to movies and books. So basically, we are becoming kind of this all everything app, as we call it now, we, we want to become the everything app. Um, and yeah, recently, uh, we actually uh, decided to actually spin out all of our non ride hailing businesses from under Uber, because Uber bought Kareem around three years ago. Uh, so, but we uh, work with Uber to kind of find a new uh, investor. Uber continues to be a large investor in the, in, in the, in the new business. Uh, but we've also got Eang, which is a large local telco, uh, which has a lot of capability uh, and resource across the region. And they've become our new partner in the super app journey. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of the update. Uh, we're very excited about the future. We're very excited about... Uh, uh, you know, building a large, uh, you know, uh, business, uh, you know, currently there are around 500 million people who live in our part of the world. And we're a mission driven company. The mission of Kareem is to, is, is twofold, uh, is to simplify and improve the lives of people and build an awesome institution that inspires. Uh, and, you know, today on that first dimension of simplifying and improving the li li lives of people, we feel, you know, on a good day, we, we, simplify the lives of about a million people, you know, in many different ways. Uh, but, you know, obviously there's another 499 million people to go. So, yeah, so we're quite excited about uh, where we are, uh, you know, what we're building uh, and, you know, having a lasting impact on the region. And the second part of our mission is to build an awesome institution that inspires uh, many of us uh, who kind of are in the management team, who lead the company, uh, you know, want to build a Google uh, of the region uh, from the region. So yeah, generally, uh, it's quite an exciting time uh, and we're very excited about what we're building. Ashish, you mentioned the word super up there a few times, I think. Um, now, how would you define, like, what is a super app? Is it like an everything app? Um, is there like a coherent definition of super apps? And also, yeah. does super apps as an idea make sense outside China? I mean, I know obviously you're going to say yes because you're, you've said you're building one, but if I can throw the question at you that super apps have really come out of a particular time and space, uh, like the noughties in China and then the 2010s, when there was, a, I guess, a specific need in China for these type of um, these type of apps. Now, why is that relevant in other parts of the world? And also your footprint is so diverse, right? I mean, you know, mm. the e economics and social of Dubai um, in many ways is more like a... I don't know, a New York or a Sydney, not a not a Karachi or a Cairo. Like, how do you like get a, how do you make the business model work? Yeah, you know, you're right. I think, look, just from a scale perspective, today we operate in 10 plus countries, uh, about 100 cities across the region. Uh, so yes, we've, you know, gotten to a certain scale, but obviously the opportunity is very big. Uh, coming back to your real question, what is a super app? I mean, I think the simplest definition, like using an analogy, is it's a mall versus a shop, right? So when you go into a big mall, you have a lot of shops. 
uh, and you basically have people come into the mall uh, to basically buy multiple products and services. I think the same dynamic is playing out uh, in on in the kind of digital space. Um, you know, one other kind of mental model that I have is look if you look at the world, uh, there's around eight billion people. Around ten percent live in the U.S. and Western Europe, uh, which are developed countries, and ninety percent live in the rest of the world. Um, and again, if you look at the US, right, you could build like out of 300 million people, 200 million people can afford to take an Uber ride. So you could build a very large business, a $50 billion business, uh, just like offering ride hailing. Uh, but if you come to most of the other parts of the world, uh, which is 90% of where the world's population lives, uh, you know, after the top 10%, uh, it's very difficult uh, for people to be able to afford the kind of services that we offer currently. I mean, our ambition is obviously to offer services that go, you know, you know, cover everybody, but today uh, it's very difficult. So as a result, uh, from a business perspective, like it makes sense to first, you know, to acquire the customer once and then sell them multiple products and services, right? And by the way, this dynamic is not just unique to the digital world. If you look at the offline space, you also see a lot of conglomerates in most emerging markets, right? Mm. Uh, including Latin America, Asia, India, China, Southeast Asia, uh, and the Middle East and Africa. So our view is that, you know, from a business perspective and the amount of investment it takes to build the platform is the same probably in the US as it is in this part of the world. So if you want to get return on investment, you need to offer multiple products, acquire the customer once and sell them multiple products and services. Now, this was all from a, from a business perspective, right? But even if you turn it around and look from a consumer perspective, uh, you know, in like in the US and Europe, people are quite comfortable, you know, using their debit card, credit card, uh, bank account and putting it in any kind of website or app because you know you're quite comfortable that you know the system you know will be fine and you'll be fine as a consumer but in our parts of the world like consumers like once they trust you they're more likely to buy more products and services from you right mm. so so both from a you know consumer perspective and from a business perspective these are two drivers that have led to the kind of rise of super apps uh, and uh, this dynamic is obviously played out in China, it's played out in Southeast Asia, in India to a certain extent, and maybe there are different dynamics. In fact, in India, it's starting to happen, right, with Reliance and Tata's and, uh, you know, many of the, you know, conglomerates now actually moving into, this, in, in, into the digital space and launching super apps. Um, and then obviously, uh, we believe the same dynamics going to play out in, uh, it's, it's also happened in Latin America, and we think the same dynamics going to play out in the Middle East. Uh, and then after that in Africa. And from a mental model perspective, I think if you look at it, it first it was China, sorry, mm -hmm. first it was the US, then 10 years later it was China, 10 years later it was India, 10 years later it was Southeast Asia, you know, 10 years later I think it's gonna be the Middle East and then it's gonna be Africa, right? So basically the whole world's going through the same journey. Uh, and yeah, I think that's what's driving kind of our belief that, you know, these two macro drivers also exist in this part of the world. Uh, we're well positioned given we have a quite, kind of a high frequency use case that was kind of our core business, which was ride hailing. So we've already acquired a lot of customers. And now we're already seeing that flywheel working like because we have multiple services in, in, in Dubai, for example. Uh, and we see we acquire the customer once and those are the customers that actually become customers of our food delivery service, our grocery delivery service, our payments. By the way, we also have a B2B business, right? We have an express logistics business. In our payments business, we have, a B, we have B2C offerings and we have B2B offerings. So it's kind of like the Amazon uh, business, right? Where they built a lot of infrastructure for themselves. And over time, they opened up most of their kind of cost lines and they made them into profit centers, right? Uh, and today you have FBA fulfillment by Amazon, but those warehouses were initially created for Amazon. But today, more than 50% of the business in them are, uh, you know, third party. My wife has a small business. She uses them and she pays them for it, right? The same thing with AWS. They built their data centers for themselves. Uh, and then they open up today. AWS is like, a, you know, big cash cow for uh, mm -hmm. Amazon, right? So, it, it, so, so again, I'm, I'm going back to from a business perspective, but even if you look from an ecosystem perspective, our vision is that, you know, five years from now, there'll be thousands of different services on our app, on our platform. Uh, we would have transitioned from being an operator to becoming a platform. And most of the services would be run by third parties, uh, but they would be able to leverage on all the infrastructure that we've built, the payments, the logistics, the demand, the distribution, the brand, uh, so, you know, let's say someone in Pakistan comes up with a business, they can just plug into the Kareem ecosystem and not just the digital ecosystem, but the whole stack. 
and suddenly they can have their product or service available across 100 cities. I mean, I'm simplifying it, but that's the vision, right? Uh, so because we know how difficult it was to build what we built uh, and how much uh, time it took and how much effort it took. And we would love to enable the ecosystem to like now leverage on our mm. kind of hard work <laughs> and, and leapfrog. Because I think every ecosystem needs some of these kind of lighthouses. Like in every country, there are these two or three big tech companies that actually like help pull up the whole ecosystem. Uh, and again, going back to given we're a mission driven company and, you know, we want to build this company that kind of simplifies and improves the lives of people. Uh, you know, we know we can't do it all by ourselves. Like we don't want to be doing everything by ourselves. We want to partner with other people uh, and let them leverage on everything that we've built to actually have massive impact in, in society. Right. So, yeah, I think that's kind of uh, sorry, a long answer to your short question. No, no, it, like, was a, yeah. it was a very it was a very good overview. Um, so from the from the company side, if you like, or the the business side, you're talking about the TAM is small in many of these countries, the effective TAM. It's not hundreds of millions of people like the population. It's a few million people. So you have to you can't go broad like in the US. You have to go you have to go deep uh, to get your TAM. Um, and from the consumer side or the user side, there's this kind of trust. Uh, brand recognition. I step into the mall. Uh, I step into the virtual mall of the Emirates or Dubai Mall once, or Dira City Center Mall once, and then I have all the shops. And I, I get that. Um, how does that, from the stepping into the mall, shopping at many shops, uh, how does that work in different countries today for you in your footprint? To the extent that you can share some of this, maybe you can't share. But so in the UAE or in Dubai. Typically, so the gateway product or the access product is ride hailing. Then how many other products do people, I mean, like, let's take a personal example. I think we must, as a family, use ride hailing by Kareem, like, I don't know, half a dozen times a day, probably, or something. Yeah. And then I use the Kareem Pay app as well. But I stopped. I haven't gone. Um, Deliveroo still got me on food. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um so i'm like a two products i guess the but a, a very very frequent user of the first one of mobility and as you know because whenever something goes wrong i i message you to complain but uh <laughs> how, how, what a typical what does a typical user in dubai look like versus the typical user in cairo versus the typical user in riyadh or karachi like how many how many yeah. products kind of how much sort of penetration do you have right now what do you think that journey becomes the next three years. Yeah. So look, I mean, to be very, very honest, we're actually a super app only in Dubai today. Oh, right? okay. Our view was that, and we offer multiple services in other countries, but if I genuinely reflect on it, like we're a super app in Dubai. And let me define what, what I mean by that. Like, so what we decided to do during COVID was mm -hmm. rather than just kind of sitting back, we decided to, you know, go from being a ride hailing company to becoming a super app. And it okay. was a journey of learning for ourselves, right? Like, it's not like we had done it before. Of course, mm -hmm. there are other models, there are other examples, but as you go through this journey, you realize how kind of complex it is from not just mm -hmm. from a, a, you know, from a resource allocation perspective, from an organizational design perspective, from, uh, you know, an execution perspective, right? Like, and it's kind of like playing three-dimensional chess, right? Like going from one product in one country to multiple products in multiple countries. It just like it's exponential in how much more complex it becomes. So we were learning uh, and, you know, I'm quite glad to say like, you know, the learnings started bearing fruit in Dubai uh, where we started to see the flywheel working. So like in Dubai, a typical customer uh, is obviously, let's say on average, they were using ride hailing five to six times a week, uh, sorry, a month. Uh, maybe they were using food delivery. The ones that knew about it were using food delivery. And by the way, most of our customers on food delivery have been acquired from our ride hailing base. Uh, by the way, we also have a JV uh, joint venture with the RTA, with the local regulator, where all the taxis in Dubai are on our platform. Uh, and by the way, I mean, just, uh, you know, there's 100 million taxi rides that happen in Dubai every year. And 40% are now on the platform. So you can imagine how big that kind of, mm. and it's only exclusive. Uh, so now all of those customers are obviously looking for other services. Uh, but anyways, coming back to it, like, yeah, all of our food delivery customers are from the Kareem uh, ride hailing base and all of the grocery customers. We have a quick commerce business. We have dark store. We've covered most of Dubai. 
they're also most like most of them are from the ride hailing base and now from the food base, which is starting to get quite large. Uh, and what we saw was, uh, you know, like on all dimensions, right? Like on transactions per user per month, like if let's say you were using just ride hailing and you were doing five, six transactions a month, or you were just using food delivery and you're just doing five, six transactions a month. If you're doing both, it's not just you're doing 10 transactions a month, but we see a huge uplift, right? So you're doing at least 30 to 40% more transactions a month. And then if you add in C+, which is our subscription program, which is kind of like our version of Amazon Prime, uh, people are doing up to 24, 25 transactions per month. So literally it's a daily use case, right? And what we also learned is that basically what consumers want is convenience, right? I mean, consumer internet is very, very simple, right? There's just three things that people want, right? They want selection, uh, they want uh, convenience, and they want value, right? And basically you can, you know, uh, if you can offer them a competitive offering, let's say in food, if we have a competitive selection and we get the food to you reliably on time, which is let's say within 30 minutes and every time it comes within 30 minutes and it's hot, uh, and you have the restaurants that you like and you can choose from, then there's really no reason to go to anybody else, right? Like, uh, and to further kind of cement that, we created this R version, which is called C+, which is, it's, it's only 19 dirhams a month. And the average subscriber of C+, and we have over 100,000 subscribers on C+, now. Uh, and basically, uh, should I keep quiet? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're, you're a subscriber. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of people are subscribers. And it's 19 dirhams a month. And most subscribers save up to 5x of that, right, in a month. Mm. So it's it's hugely kind of uh, beneficial. So long story short, we see the flywheel working on the super app in Dubai. And this is why we've done uh, this partnership where we've rolled out, we've got a new investor slash partner, uh, Ian, into the business. Because obviously they're also, uh, you know, seeing the same opportunity. And they saw us as a good way of partnering with us to, like, tap into this opportunity. And then obviously scale this across the region. So... Uh, our priorities are like, you know, start with the GCC and then go wider into the whole kind of uh, geographical region over time. Uh, and that's what we're working on. So we're just going to go step by step and become a super app and, you know, city by city, offer more services city by city, and then basically roll it out. I don't awesome. know if I answered all of that. <laughs> I want to bring Gaurav into the conversation before I confess any more of my personal habits, like how many C plus <laughs> memberships we have in our household or anything like that. But, uh, there's a couple, I think, at least. But anyway, Gaurav, over to you. Thanks so much, Ronit. Ashish, a pleasure to have you joining us uh, today. I mean, this is one of my favorite conversations. As, as you know, payments is 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 my jam, you know, it's like Austin Powers. So this is my jam, baby. This is my jam. So I love this conversation. Uh, congratulations on a, a second exit almost in a, in a kind of way, heading towards a third exit, right? I mean, it's wonderful for this region to see activity and adoption happening as you're stepping up from the ladder. You know, Kareem started with Mudassar Magnus and a few people. It evolved into something that a, a global giant bought, which is Uber. And now you've got a local giant that's an international player also participating. So it's very, 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 very encouraging to see the ecosystem also evolving, right? And, and I hope this trend continues for recognition of technology revenue of companies all throughout. So it's wonderful to be speaking with you and having your time and perspective with us here today. So as Ronit said, I want to tear into some other parts of the, the conversation. So like we, we, we have most of these conversations, they're all very in earnest. So if there's something you can't share with us, because of, obviously we have to respect you have a, a corporate agreement and there are some things as part of the rumor map that you can't share. So, but I will, I will poke and prod for the sake of our audience to really try and just see what we can extract from you in this exciting current moment, right? Because this is a moment in history, really. Um, so the first thing I want to start with is I want to talk about competition uh, in the region, right? Um, like you very clearly said to Ronit and, and told everyone here today on our, on our podcast, you are a super app only in the UAE today. Now, there are obviously aspirations for you to become a super app in other ecosystems very strongly, especially, especially with the, 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 the powering or the, the, the reinforcement of Etisalat e and as it's known today, to help you do that. But who do you see as your top 
competitors in the region because it's it's a blurred ecosystem today, right? The internet has dropped barriers everywhere. You know, uh, everyone has backing from billions of dollars of funding or millions of dollars of funding. Money in this region is not the issue. Navigating the way and getting to the path and keeping a customer and keeping them sticky, right? Like you talked about with, and Ronald talked about the future TAM of a single customer as opposed to the TAM of a, of a larger number of customers. But who do you see in that perspective as being your biggest competitor? Is it STC Pay? Is it uh, another telco uh, that's going to be there? Is it another ride hailing app? Can you tell us more about who you see as your main threats? Yeah. Look, honestly, we're not very focused on competition. Like my view on the market is if we're very early in the consumer internet revolution. Like I said, we're probably in this region, we're still about 10 years behind Southeast Asia, right? Like, and we're very, very early. We have a young population, which is digitally connected that wants access to products and services today in a convenient manner. And that's what we focus on, right? We focus on the customer. We focus, and by the way, we're a three-sided marketplace, right? We have customers, people like you guys who are buying services. Uh, we call our couriers or our drivers, we call them captains. So we have captains. Uh, and then now we have merchants, right? Like we have shops, we have restaurants that are selling their products and services through our app. Uh, and all of these people are our customers. So we're actually like, we're actually creating a captain super app, a customer super app, a merchant super app, because you could have a different uh, version of yourself in a different avatar, right? Like you could be a captain who's driving, but then you might need some services. Like let's say you've earned some money in the UAE or Saudi and you're from Pakistan or India and you want to remit that money to them. We can provide you that remittance service right on the day. We can pay you directly into the wallet on the app and then they can remit that money directly back to Pakistan through the app, right? Uh, or to India or to Egypt or wherever they're from. So, so we are looking at like, we try to like, look, what are the problems that people are facing in the region? And we focus on those problems and we try to come up with solutions to those problems using technology. And then we offer them. And my belief is it's not a market of one. There's going to be multiple different uh, versions uh, of businesses that emerge to try to solve these problems. And I think we can, you know, probably park this question. I mean, I, I think in a saturated market where, you know, everyone has whatever service you're offering, you start worrying about competition. Uh, in our markets where we're like probably very, very early, right? Sub 10% penetration digitally, um, you know, and if you look at other countries like China or the US or even India, they're far ahead, right? In terms of digital penetration. So I think there's a lot of room to grow and let a thousand flowers bloom and we welcome competition. I think competition also focuses the mind and makes you stronger. Uh, it, it, it's like when you play tennis with a good tennis player, you play better tennis, right? So we love competition, right? We love people to come and push us and, you know, it pushes us to become better. So yeah, we don't really look at anybody. As long. And I think given the number of businesses we're in, probably the competitors by business would be different. People have different ambitions and how they want to run their businesses. So I think like I wouldn't be able to comment on any specific competitor, uh, but I, I, I do believe there will be multiple options available for the consumer as they should be, right? Because that's what makes uh, the consumer experience the best. And that's kind, kind of ultimately uh, what we want, right? Because if there are multiple players playing in the market, pushing each other, uh, firstly, the market will expand, consumers will get educated, uh, consumers will get better choices. It'll, it'll keep us on our feet. We'll have to kind of work harder to like offer better services. So, so I mean, we're just focused on the customers. We're not focused on the on on, on competition. I mean, we don't yeah think of them much. Yet. It's it's amazing to capture the statement that you've made right when you're saying that you don't really see somebody out there as a competitor in the market, and you're focusing on customers. 10 years ago, if you had made that same statement, it wouldn't have been possible given the fact that the ecosystem itself has evolved so much in terms of the way we can connect people together and, and focus on the customer, along with licensing requirements actually to engage with them for different parts of the business, right? It's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, I, I think we have to take a pause and really recognize that because the way that the ecosystem has actually allowed for businesses like Kareem to become Kareem Pay would not have been possible 10 years ago. A bank was a bank, a telco was a telco, a lender was a lender, and that's it. And everyone had to operate in silos. And today, uh, you know, people can be multifaceted businesses operating from a critical mass point of view like yourself. So it's, it's, it's amazing to see that happening, really. By the way, I mean, I think what enables this is also kind of the governments that 
of the region in which we operate, right? We have very, very progressive governments, which are very tech savvy, that want to use technology to solve problems for their citizens. Uh, and they've been very supportive. Uh, the other thing is that we're very clear, like, for example, you mentioned a bunch of financial services, like we do not want to become a regulated financial institution. We don't want to become a bank, right? We're a technology company. We use technology to solve people's problems. And we want to partner with, you know, regulated financial institutions to kind of uh, leverage all the capabilities that they have, such as banks, et cetera. So for example, like we have partnered with Fab to kind of launch many of our financial services in Dubai, right? We, we've also obviously, uh, you know, we, we've also applied to, uh, you know, the regulator for our own license, but we're happy to partner with people, right? Like, I mean, and now with EAN, like EAN is obviously a very, very large and resourceful company. Uh, and we're very happy to them, have them as our, you know, main shareholder and uh, partner with them. And they're very advanced in their own uh, kind of fin fintech ambitions, right? Uh, so you, yeah, we, we believe in partnerships. We believe in collaboration. Uh, we believe that we should work together with the ecosystem uh, to kind of grow the entire ecosystem. We also feel a lot of responsibility, very honestly, right? Like, I mean, you, you mentioned the word exit. Like, I, we don't believe we exited, right? Like, we never exited. Like, we actually got a new shareholder. <laughs> in uh, we continue to run the company as passionately as we were prior to kind of having them as a shareholder. And we continue to have them as a shareholder now, even in chapter three, right? Uh, we just have a new shareholder. Uh, in yeah. <laughs> And we don't plan to exit. So our, our ambition is to build a Google from the region and have a lasting legacy, right? We want to build a world-class tech institution from the region uh, that will, you know, exist far beyond our involvement in, in this institution, right? Uh, and uh, it will continue to attract and retain the top tech talent and top talent in general to kind of come and solve the problems of people in this part of the world using technology. Right. So that's kind of our ambition. So we, you know, we want to kind of build this company up and, you know, ideally list it. Right. Uh, you know, so that it continues and it, you know, sustains far beyond any of us. Uh, that is what we want to do. Right. And that's our ambition. That's always brilliant and encouraging to hear, especially for everyone who's a Kareem user out there or potential Kareem user for the new services and products you provide. So that's that's. That's very reassuring and thanks for, for putting that forward. I think in this market, another thing is given the fact that M&A doesn't happen on the scale in technology businesses that we're witnessing now, especially with what you're going through, I can only imagine how long the process was actually for you in terms of engaging someone yeah. like Etisalat at the scale that they are and you know the scale of the the transaction that has occurred, right, in this new avatar that you are with E and Atislat and yourself as Karim Bey. I mean, that process is very long, but there's, like you said, a very developed review that was internally happening at Atislat E and in their fintech uh, journey that they were on, and you are on your journey. M and A is never a shuffling of the deck and dealing the cards straightforward. There's there's a process at which things settle in the process. One team takes lead, another team takes another lead. There's a lot of moving parts to this before the real uh, effect, the multiplier effect, if you can say, of, of having at least slot benefits and then Kareem pays benefits really take place. So where does that start and where does that go? I mean, this is a journey for the next three years, five years, seven years. To start with in that discovery process, do you think, you know, do, is, is it something that's very straightforward or you run it as a, as a standalone entity or is there a lot of work to be done now on how that path is, is charted forward? Can you give us some insights on what yeah, that looks like for m, &M actually, because Yeah, you mentioned a couple of different things. So let me talk about the, the process, right? Like, so obviously, like, finding the right partner it was very important. I mean... Capital is obviously important, but more than that, I think the, the meeting of the minds, the kind of Absolutely. meeting of the vision, the meeting, the, the chemistry between the people. It's a marriage. Uh, yeah, it's a marriage, right? Like, so it's kind of, and, uh, you know, like as our founder, very, uh, he says it very nicely that basically uh, it, it's kind of like you're making a jigsaw puzzle and then, you know, you're kind of like, you know, moving pieces around and suddenly you 
something like happens and everything just fits together. And that's kind of what happened with Ethis Love, or Ian, right? Like we just, when we met them, we were like, oh, wow. Like I wish we had met them earlier, right? And then, you know, <laughs> the, the process was, uh, you know, it's, it's a complex deal. And, uh, you know, a lot of people uh, had to kind of be involved, uh, lots of, you know, lawyers and, m a people and, uh, you know, principals and... Uh, How things. long did the process take? I mean, I, I'm not sure I should comment on it, but it took a while. It took a while. It took a while, right? <laughs> and uh, but it, it finally landed and we're very happy with, with where it landed. And, uh, you know, obviously, like I said, like the, part of the reason I think why this seems to be like a good marriage or good match is, uh, you know, Ian is very, uh, you know, motivated to kind of offer digital services to the consumer. Ian is a very, very large company uh, with 100 million plus subscribers across the region. Their footprint is very, very similar to ours. Um, and so there's opportunities to collaborate all across the footprint. Uh, obviously, we're starting with the UAE because that's kind of where we are right now. Uh, but, you know, over the next three to five years, you will see us kind of spreading out across the region uh, with Ian. We're already in many of these countries with ride hailing where they operate and we also operate. But we'll also start offering many of our other services in conjunction with them. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's quite exciting. Uh, there's a lot of support uh, right from the top of uh, the Ian, uh, you know, the, the company. And obviously, like, we're very excited about it. Uh, of course, this, it's going to require a lot of hard work to make sure that, you know, a lot of value creation happens. But everyone is, you know, like quite incentivized to make it happen, right? Because we're all kind of synchronized by kind of uh, the kind of setup that we've set uh, in place. So, yeah, I, I'm quite confident it's going to be a very successful partnership. Just getting into talking about products specifically, E and has its consumers on one side where they're offering services, finance, they have an e-wallet, they have loyalty, smiles, you have yours. Do they operate standalone? Do they merge at some point as well? Do they fold into each other? No, no. I think the plan is that like let a thousand flowers bloom. Like it's kind of like when you go stay in a Marriott, you don't even know you're staying in a Marriott. Like the, the 65 brands in the Marriott family, uh, consumers like choice and the different kind of, you know, cuts to that. Uh, so, yeah, there's going to be like a, a lot of coexistence and a lot of collaboration, a lot of, uh, you know, at the back end, we can do a lot of uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, synergy or value creation uh, of, you know, on both sides. Uh, but we're going to have multiple different uh, brands in the market uh, to give consumers choice. right? Uh, and again, it's like, you know, let let let's get the growth there's so much growth ahead of us that we need to basically uh focus i mean like in terms of you ask for competition right like in terms of competition for fintechs right like uh it's cash it's not like other fintechs right like, because like it's still a very cash driven economy right like across the region uh including the uae right so i mean like i think uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of that like offline business that needs to be brought online, right? Like payments need to be brought online. Like everything should be like brought online, right? Because it just makes life so much simpler. I don't know if you remember the days when we used to book airline tickets using books, right? Like with travel agents and people are matching schedules. And now we don't even remember that, right? Like, I mean, uh, yeah, it's just everything is like, should be simple, right? It should just be, you click a button and all the choices come and then you should just be able to click a button and it gets done. And actually the real problems to solve are the offline problems, right? The online problems are relatively easy to solve. But once you start solving offline problems, right? Like, which is like requires operations. So we're like, we're a tech company, but we are also, we have a lot of operations and we use technology to make those operations much more efficient uh, and also much more uh, consumer centric, right? Uh, I mean, you know, AI is a much used like buzzword, but like machine learning, uh, AI can predict where the captain needs to be in order to pick up that next parcel to take it to the you know customer, the next food delivery or the next grocery delivery. Or like when someone's shopping on the app, we should be able to predict what is it that you want. And that, let's say you're using six services on our app, we should be able to predict what does Gaurav want 
at 7 a.m. in the morning? What does he want at 10 a.m. in the morning? What does he want at, you know, 12, 12 o'clock? Like, what does he want at 3 o'clock? What does he want at... I mean, like, we would love to have you on the app doing everything that you do, uh, you know, from, like, morning till evening, right? And for the rest of your lives. And, I mean, that's kind of what the, you know, Chinese super apps have done, right? Fundamentally, WeChat and Ali, uh, you know, I mean, you know, Alibaba, Ta Taobao, Tmall, Alipay. I mean, in a way, I think, yeah... That's kind of the journey we're on, right? That's what we want to emulate. And if you even look at them, they've done it a lot of it through partnerships, right? Like, I mean, they haven't done everything in-house. Uh, so yeah, I think there's a lot of learning that we can leverage from other parts of the world to kind of build out this uh, business. But I think at the end of the day, like, you know, we just have to keep the consumer in mind, right? Like, and we need to know, like, what does the consumer want? Like, what, do, what are their problems? Like, uh, and if you solve those problems automatically, you know, there'll be demand for your products and services and automatically, you know, you, you know, simplifying and improving li lives of people. So, I mean, we keep our mission always front and center in our minds, like, because ultimately that's our kind of North Star. That's where, that's what guides us. That's what drives us. The business is kind of an outcome of that, right? So if you keep the customer in mind, we simplify their life, automatically the business gets created, right? Uh, yeah. Very logical. Know. No, you did. It's very, it's very logical path to follow, right? From from origin to future. So, I think you know. Speaking of future, we would be remiss if, if you know, in our title it says fintech and web three. I would have to ask, you know, the the two things you mentioned. You're looking about a playbook from Asia, right? Which is very, very, very hyper developed with partnerships as well as building out their own ecosystem where people can plug into those partnerships or you can service your critical mass of users, which you want to stay in that ecosystem as much as possible that you're providing for, right? With your three-sided marketplace. Yeah. How much of what you're going to be doing, given that you're in one of the capitals globally, if not the capital globe for Web3 and blockchain today, how much are you going to be following or looking to get inspiration from that existing roadmap from those super apps? And how much of are you going to be maybe tinkering or tapping towards what's happening in, in the Web3 blockchain space at all? Because it is a relevant topic here. Is that part yeah. of a roadmap? Are we going to see things from yeah, yeah. the yeah, Korean super app in that space? Or is it just the super app story you're going to follow very traditionally and just own that? No, story? no, no. I, I, look, I, I don't think you can just copy and paste, right? Like what happened right. in China happened and it was unique to the Chinese circumstances from 20 years ago, right? Like, so if you just right. copy and paste, you're going to fail. Right. So fundamentally, they can be our inspiration, but like we're going to build our own like business over here based on the local requirements. We're a local company, right? We were built out of the region. We're built for the region and every country that we operate in, we're considered the local player, right? Like, so we are, you know, we pride ourselves in that and having like local insights, etc. Now, obviously, uh, like my belief is like AI is going to be critical for success in the future, right? Because right now, as we scale from where we are to, let's say, 100 times bigger than where we are today, we cannot do things manually. We have to use artificial intelligence. We have to use machine learning. We have to use technology, right? I, I, I believe it's the same thing on blockchain, right? It's kind of like, it's the underlying technology that basically allows trust to be built between two different sets of people uh, that don't know each other, right? Which And it audits itself. So I think we have to use blockchain, right? Like, for example, if we're remitting money from the UAE to Pakistan or UAE to India or UAE to Egypt, uh, you know, right now we would use the traditional payment trails, but in the future, regulation permitting, we could use blockchain to do that, right? Uh, if we want to give loans to our captains, right, to buy a car or buy a bike so that they don't have to kind of maybe rent it from someone else, uh, you know, we could basically use their earnings uh, history, uh, which we have, uh, and then we could basically, uh, you know, give them a loan, like a, maybe a salary advancement based on that of somebody else's balance sheet but we do kind of the credit assessment and then obviously because we know their future earnings are also linked to us uh, we can also hold back some of those earnings to pay back that loan so the credit risk goes down and all of this stuff can happen using blockchain right like we don't need to do this in a, in a paper-based lending system right uh, now obviously I'm not an expert on this in this field I mean I am an engineer but from 25 years ago but we have a very good tech team uh, and, you know, they're constantly looking at how to use technology to solve people's problems. So it comes back to it. I mean, actually, this is how Alipay was built, right? Like, if you go back to the history of, and I'm sure Ronit and you have probably studied it too, but, you know, Alipay initially, when it was built, it was not supposed to be a standalone payments app. It was built because, like, e-commerce was just 
growing really rapidly in China and the small merchants needed working capital loans uh, and they would get paid at the end of the month. So they didn't have the working capital to like finance the growth of their business. And what Alipay started doing was saying, okay, fine. Like, you know, if you want to get paid one day after the sale, we'll give you 98 cents on the dollar, right? Like, uh, and they suddenly started getting the cash flow that could be used to then build their business. Uh, and then, you know, they also created an escrow mechanism to create trust between like, you know, C to C, like let's say you and me are doing a transaction. They said, okay, fine. I don't know you. You don't know me. We don't trust each other, but there's an intermediary that both of us trust. So I'll hold on to the money till I get it released. And then over time, they then got into other services and they said P2P was a big problem, right? Because people didn't have credit cards, they didn't have debit cards, they had to pay digital payments without credit cards and debit cards. How do you do digital payments? So they created like wallets that were used to kind of make payments. Now, obviously at that time, blockchain didn't exist, but I'm sure if you dig into it now, I'm sure all of them are using a lot of blockchain underlying these yes. kind of businesses. And we, we will do the same thing, right? Uh, going forward. I mean, right now, I mean, like to be very kind of, humble, like, you know, we don't believe we have the license to kind of start lending money to people. Like people are like, why is this taxi company lending money to me, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, like, but so we are like getting into adjacent use cases, right? Like where it's, okay, we'll allow, we'll enable you to pay for a service on Kareem using your wallet, right? Or but, to pay but are you going to move into the other space, right? The okay. one next to it, which is, which is, okay, I have a wallet. I can keep money with you. Will I do buying crypto and staking? Are you going to do things like that? Or with I, don't partners? I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think we will build that ourselves. If we do it, we do right. it in partnership with some big, large players. Uh, I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, because look, we cannot be the expert at everything, right? Like we right. want to be, yeah, we have a platform. We, it's an, Kind of, we want it to be an open platform. We want people to plug into that platform. We have consumers of all types and people should be allowed to kind of give them what they want, right? And if there is a demand for that, then happy to kind of enable that. I mean, to be honest, we have a very ambitious roadmap, right? Like with the existing services that we're offering, we're still very early. So we need to first kind of make some progress in that, right? Uh, you know, I have a simple crawl before you walk, before you run, right? Like if you want to win the gold medal in the Olympics, you have to start by like kind of crawling, right? Like, so I think we're kind of maybe walking now, right? And then we're going to start running and then we're going to say, okay, we want to win the 100 meter race in the Olympics, right? So it's kind of like a journey. Uh, probably it's like a five to 10 year journey. Uh, it's not going to happen. Everything's not going to happen overnight. And by the way, like the more things you add, the more complex your business becomes, right? Like, so like I said, three dimensional chess and like, maybe you look on like five dimensional chess. I don't know what that means, but like, you know, and that just creates a lot of complexity, but yeah, no, we absolutely believe in the technology. We absolutely believe, I mean, we're a tech company at the end of the day, right? Like how, how can we not? Right. So it's just like, uh, but yeah, the applications of blockchain are going to kind of surface themselves over the next, I believe three to five to 10 years i think this chat gpt moment really made artificial intelligence like real oh, yeah. and then like, some yeah. chat gpt bard it's yeah. really yeah. lit the fire everywhere it's insane right like i mean the kind of stuff that you can do with it so like yeah i think that's definitely on the top of our minds uh uh blockchain no and, doubt yeah no yeah. doubt yeah. it's gonna be but very exciting yeah go ahead i think evolution of these technologies and offerings is only going to get accelerated right so the, the next question I want to ask, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners and, and people who are seeing this right now, you know, when they come back to this podcast, they'll want to retrace their steps to see sort of what you said and go, aha, he did say that, he didn't say that right? They're going to they're gonna come for you. They're going to come for you. We're recording this in time. So with no pressure whatsoever, Ashish, I have to yeah. ask you, yeah. what's the next geography for the Super App? Is that something you can tell us or you can't tell us? No, no, I, I don't know if it's a big secret, but like, yeah, our focus right now is the UAE and Saudi. So these are the two countries we're focused on. So the next one's like going to be Saudi for sure. Okay, great. I mean, that's uh, that's that's something, I, I, you know, while you say it's no big secret, it's also something that it's it's quite a statement to make because it's obviously a big market. People understand this region. They usually say UAE, KSA, you know, Egypt and some neighboring areas, Pakistan, they talk about very key areas for expanding and moving quickly. So it's, it's very interesting to, you know, to understand that is the, the place you're going. And you obviously have a significant share and operation in that market. I think for me, the last thing that I want to talk about before I, before I hand back to Ronit is 
uh, as an entrepreneur myself who builds businesses, helps businesses, an ecosystem player. The other piece of the conversation that I think is, is interesting to give people understanding and in, in insight, right, from where you're sitting, which is very precious right now to, to give people that genuine information is team building is something in an ecosystem like ours that's not, it's not straightforward to, to build uh, a team and to keep growing that team. Especially when, if you go back throughout this entire podcast, you talk about evolution of product, you talk about evolution of technology, you talk about servicing the customer, you're talking about licenses, you're talking about things evolving. And this requires a, a great team to keep building things in place because like you can't build the ecosystem yourself with partners, you can't build Kareem as a single engineer. And, you know, and once an engineer, always an engineer, Ashish, but, <laughs> but you can't do everything yourself. So how big is your team today, right? And going five, five years in the future, minimum, right? This is a five to 10 year journey, you said. How big do you think the team's gonna be then? And is it gonna be easy to, to scale and recruit those people? Because there's a real, real competition for talent in the market, you know, the population size, everything. What do you think is gonna happen there? How does that look yeah. like for you, that team? Yeah, uh, it's a very good question. I think, look, this is the most important thing in any business. Business is a team sport, right? Like you can't do anything by yourself. Uh, so actually, as a leader of a business, this is the most important job that you have is building an amazing team and the entire team at every level should be better than you, right? Uh, you're kind of an orchestra, like a conductor at an orchestra and the team is actually like playing the roles, right? Like, so fundamentally, like that's the most important job that you have. Uh, yeah, I think look, it's a lot like it's, it's a lot easier now to build a team compared to 10 years ago when Kareem started. Uh, but obviously still challenging tech talent is in huge demand globally. Everybody is fighting over tech talent, uh, and talent in general. Uh, I think this part of the world has become super attractive for talent. I mean, we're seeing a huge inflow of talent from all over the world coming to this part of the world from Russia, from China, from India, from the, from Europe, from the U S I think for young people, I'm a huge fan of, of the UAE and of the region. And I think a lot of people should come, whoever's listening to this, like, you know, come <laughs> and check it out. Like, it's a great part of the world to be in. Uh, and, you know, this is kind of, you know, we're building the future. So, like, you know, uh, please reach out and we'd be happy to kind of have you join us. But on a more serious note, I think, uh, yeah, I think the team, our team currently is, uh, it's around uh, 2,000 people across the region. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, yeah, it's only going to get bigger, right? Uh, because given our, uh, you know, ambition is to build, uh, you know, an everything app across the region, multiple products, multiple businesses, multiple, uh, you know, countries, uh, we're just going to be, yeah, hiring a lot of people. Uh, uh, yeah, so that's what it is. And I, 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 I personally think, uh, you know, given kind of the support of the government and all the progressive policies that have been put in place, I don't think it's going to be that tough, very honestly. Uh, but I don't know, maybe I'll have to eat humble crow, right? Uh, but no, I, I think <laughs> Listen, I'm a huge yeah. The road yeah. the road to hell is paved with good intentions. But you know, having said that, everyone <laughs> everyone has to do their best efforts to do yeah, you have to believe, right? right? You have to believe. Like, I mean, you have to believe, right? I mean, if you look at how the US was built, the US was built by the self-belief of people that they can do it, right? That's how the U.S., that's how Silicon Valley, I, I lived and worked in Silicon Valley for seven years, right? Like, I mean, uh, a, yeah, a while back, but that's what you felt when you were there. Anything is possible, right? Like, I mean, and that's the belief that people need to have in themselves. Anything is possible. I mean, I, to be honest, I think, yeah, this country has that belief, right? Like, I mean, that anything is possible, right? Like, and that's why we are here today. And like, you look at what's happened and, uh, you know, even the talent, like I've seen, I've been here six years and how the talent has increased and you go to, Riyadh and you feel that same buzz, you feel that same energy, right? And you go to Abu Dhabi, you go to Dubai, like, I mean, you feel the energy, you look at what happened with the Qatar World Cup, right? It's incredible, right? Like, I mean, what, what what's getting pulled up? World-class infrastructure, world-class governance, world-class, uh, you know, education, healthcare, uh, safety, security, uh, great airlines, great airports, right? Like, you can come in and out, like, you know, and uh, it's a very attractive place and, you know, good entertainment for families, etc. Uh, so it's a great place to live and bring up your families and, uh, you know, 
uh, now recently with all these immigration reforms, et cetera, it, it's, it's pretty incredible what's happening here, right? So I, I actually am a huge, huge, huge believer in the future. So it's, yeah, I think, you know, if you believe in it, it will happen, right? No. You have to manifest your own destiny, right? Like if you yeah, don't believe, yeah. You're definitely preaching to the choir, you know, it, yeah. for me being born out here, I'm super proud of that. So yeah, yeah and, it doesn't, and it gets even more and more every year, you know. It, yeah, every year. And I had nothing to do with it, right? My grandfather came here and everything happened and just this place evolved at the pace it did, which is unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, you know, the joke I tell people is when I used to go to school, it used to be that when people say, where are you from? And I used to have to explain where Dubai was. And it was, you know, it was very tough to explain to them where on a map it was. And then when, you know, you eventually got to university, you told people you're from Dubai and people said, oh, it's a very interesting place. Tell us more about it. And when I started working here, people, when they found out you're in Dubai, they're like, when can we come and see you and stay with you? And can you tell us, you know, more, you know, what else is happening out there? And today there's no need for an, an introduction. Now you have to, now it's just out of control. It's unbelievable. Yeah, it's great. It's but, great. but Ashish, you know, thank you so much for sharing all of what you could with us today. Um, you know, we will come back to you at some point and, and pick these points. <laughs> To, to bits on your roadmap and a few other ambitions. Just I wish you all the best. Wish your team all the best. Congratulations once again. Pleasure having you and run it back to you. So thank you, Gaurav. Maybe just as one last question, Ashish. Uh, you've given us a hymn to Dubai, uh, hymn to the company, but what gets you out of bed? <laughs> you've been you've been at Kareem a long time. We're gonna assume Wadasir is not listening to this or your public affairs and <laughs> people. Like, how much longer do you want to be at Kareem? I mean, look, I mean, it's you know, like like I said, like business is a team sport, right? And companies mm. are just collections of people. And I feel very like lucky and blessed to have found this collection of people mm. that has kind of you know given my dream like dreams wings, right? Like, I mean, like again, I think the mission of Kareem is quite inspiring. Uh, I think that like, yeah, like to say it in a very positive way, right? I just feel it's unique. Uh, you know, Kareem is driven, genuinely driven by the mission uh, to simplify and improve the lives of people and to build an awesome institution that inspires them. That's so much bigger than anything else, right? Uh, and I believe people are people, humans are humans. And when you get this opportunity to work with an amazing group of people, uh, that you know are on this mission together to build this incredible institution. I think it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. So I can't think of anything more exciting I could be possibly doing uh, rather than doing what I'm doing. And yeah, I, I mean, I have a great boss. I have a great uh, group of people uh, that I work with and a great team, you know? So uh, yeah, like it, it's, it's a lovely uh, job. I don't even think of it as a job to be honest, right? It's like my company, it's my business. Like, you know, I'm just running it, right? Like, so a part of the team that's running it. So it's, 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 a, it's a great feeling. Yeah. So uh, if I sum it all up, you love Dubai, you love Kareem, you love the team, you love with us, sir. It's just big love everywhere. So thank you for joining. It thank is. you for joining it us today. Nice. It's been awesome yeah. to have you. Um, as you know, both Garib and I are super frequent users of your products. So onwards and upwards. Awesome, awesome. Thank you guys. Thank you for having me. Thank Take you. Care. Bye. See you.